welcome back we were talking about appreciating uh, change and we concluded our discussion in the last session that sometimes no change is the change required uh, but supposedly if uh, we have to incorporate any particular change so we have to then the second step in that model is that we have to mobilize the support then and when we have to mobilize the support it is said that this phase is closely related to the earlier phase of appreciating change this phase is not only meant to gather support for the change effort but also aimed at collecting information and ideas that would give you a better appreciation of change okay and three categories of people who play a role in any change process they are basically the people who are going to uh, provide the support for change and they are the change strategists the change implementers and the change recipients okay and the, by, by the expression of change recipients we mean to address uh, those people uh, who are going to be affected by the change okay so once the uh, need for the change is uh, visualized the second step would be to mobilize the support uh, for that particular change once the support is mobilized and we have identified the change strategists change implementers and change recipients the next step would be building change capacity and when we use the expression of this building change capacity we are concerned with periods of stability are periods of convergence this is a very interesting uh, expression that during the time of stability actually uh, things converge back uh, to make a unified whole okay so during period of convergence organizations make only minor or incremental uh, change to their uh, strategies people and processes and uh, remember one thing that uh, as we said the change is a uh, constant and change is in an in inevitable uh, changes that is an inevitable uh, phenomena so there are two types of expressions we have in this category evolutionary change and the revolutionary change and uh, this particular convergence we are talking about is actually the evolutionary change which is slow and steady so these uh, changes uh, which are uh, basically required for our uh, problems to be addressed uh, they may include refining the policies uh, developing the appropriate procedures, uh, incorporating new methods of uh, manufacturing operations and uh, production, creating specialized units, uh, linking mechanisms to improve efficiency and quality, improving selection, training and appraisal procedures, promoting organizational commitment among employees, or there can be a phenomena of uh, clarifying the roles. Uh, which is the basic uh, requirement uh, to build up the change capacity because uh, unless and until we don't do such uh, actions uh, it would be difficult for us to uh, talk about or implement the change once the change capacity is uh, developed the last uh, step in this uh, model is that we have to now execute the change and in this execution it involves creating and putting in place new structures processes or procedures it entails creating coordinating mechanisms such as cross-functional teams and new routines for improvement and innovation okay so starting from the identification of the change then going through building the change capacity and then implementing the change procedures these are the steps which are basically addressed in this particular model uh, remember one thing that whenever we talk about the change as i told you earlier that human element is the most important concern in this uh, whole transition so therefore uh, when we are managing the transition human side of the change is something we need to focus upon in that regard it is said that one of the main reasons for the failure of change programs is that managers believe they can control reactions to the change this theme is about the willingness of individuals and organizations as a whole to change okay as we have just seen in the clip of uh, the ceo of uh, simmons corporation and he was uh, also telling us that uh, the pivotal role uh, in the whole change process is actually uh, dependent upon the human element the, the managers the, the people who are actually there to interact with everyday life uh, aspects so individuals often 
have good reason to fear change. In the past, change may have meant redundancy, changes to working patterns, change in status, changes in beliefs and values associated with work. So there can be many shapes and many uh, moods and uh, shades of uh, the change process. But remember one thing that if you talk about change and do not change the reward and recognition system, nothing changes. Okay, your whole effort can just go down the drain if you do not change the reward and recognition system because everyone is going to ask you one question that what's in it for them and unless and until you do not show them that what's in it for them, they would not be ready to accept that particular change. And if you force that change upon them, what would happen that there would be the exposure to certain organizational fears. Okay. So when we talk about uh, the organizational fears, as it is written on the slide as well, that individuals often have good reason to fear change. Let's see that what type of fears uh, can always come up. Some common organizational fears which people would have and they would be resisting to the change may include fear of failure. They may have fear of not getting credit for your work. They may have fear of losing your job. They may have fear of looking stupid or incompetent. They may have fear of losing control. They may have fear of being yelled at or reprimanded in some way. They may have the fear of speaking up. They may have the fear of change. They may have the fear of getting stuck in your job. And they may have the fear of being irrelevant. And there would be a never ending list of the fears which people would have. And as a result, they would resist to the change. So it's hard to reveal your inner fears and thoughts with your colleagues. Work is supposed to be professional, but it would be very difficult uh, that it would be very difficult for you that uh, to overcome the fears uh, and at the same time uh, accept the change, which might not be giving you uh, enough benefit uh, apparently. Now, again, referring back to the uh, transition and uh, dealing with the human side of the change, it is said that we have to sometimes need to change the culture of an organization. As you all know, I usually define a culture uh, with an expression that uh, structure plus human is equal to culture. Okay, so structure, as you know, it might uh, be uh, including the details of physical outlook departments and hierarchy. And once the uh, structure is incorporated with the human, the human comes up with uh, values, the human comes up with norms, the human comes up with you know, thought processes, the human comes up with emotions, the human comes up with intelligence. And with all his norms, values, emotions, and intelligence, human is also subjected to uh, fears. And along with those fears, uh, they would be looking for what's in it for them. Okay. So many a times we need to change the culture if we need to incorporate that particular change which we are going to uh, translate in our uh, routine life okay uh, again i would refer you to the clip we have just gone through about the simmons and uh, the ceo was also referring us to uh, the phenomena that he has to bring in a change in the overall culture of the organization so in this theme we will bring some of the threads about organizational culture together and investigate the nature of an organization's culture. And remember, when we need to talk about uh, culture, we need to be uh, clear that how we're going to measure that particular culture. We, we can uh, uh, use the dimensions of the culture uh, to be evaluated. Uh, we can uh, talk about the cultural web. There are different models uh, we uh, use to assess the organizational cultural perspective. Okay. Um, and obviously, um, as somebody is uh, like uh, commenting in the Zoom chat room, that there is also a fear of breaking the uh, comfort zone. No doubt, there are indefinite number of fears uh, we can uh, talk about. There is a very interesting fear, another interesting fear, uh, that is fear of the unknown. Uh, that is, again, uh, something which uh, usually uh, people don't talk about, but there is another fear, which is fear of the unknown. People just don't know that why they are uh, having the fear. Okay. So, all these things, when you know, uh, come together, uh, they are to be addressed in the cultural perspective. Okay, and when we talk about cultural perspective, we have to look upon evaluation of the barriers 
to change represented by the attitudes of individuals we have to design strategies for reinforcing the forces for change and overcoming those barriers we have to analyze characteristics of organization's current culture and we have to define key characteristics of desired future culture okay so we have to be very much careful and vigilant about the cultural uh, dimensions and cultural uh, constraints and cultural conditions so that whatever change we are going to plan uh, should be incorporated uh, effectively and efficiently to analyze all these uh, aspects there is a very interesting uh, model known as force field model because remember whenever you are going to uh, talk about change you're going to apply your driving forces to bring in a change there would be equal resistance okay as i was referring you to uh, newton's third law of motion that action and reaction are equal but opposite in direction so your action is the driving force and the reaction you you should be expecting is the resisting force and if there is no resistance as i talked earlier if there is no resistance that would be the state of inertia and inertia is actually opposite to the change okay so when we uh, talk about force field model it visualizes the power balance and the strong forces in the form of feelings values power and politics that are resisting change okay uh, for example an automation of the production process due to uneven quality and long lead times is something which is calling in to bring in a change the increased competition will otherwise put us out of business the second phenomena which is calling us to change now to address this happening uh, the driving forces we are incorporating would be we are going to talk about better quality we are going to faster manufacturing uh, process so these are the driving forces but at the same time there would be resistances coming in the old values would be the resistance misunderstanding and lack of trust would be the resistance as you know uh, again i'm referring uh, to the clip of uh, the ceo we have just uh, gone through and he was talking about the trust development why he was talking about the trust development because he wanted to overcome the resistance to the change okay the resisting forces are always there to stop the change and the driving forces are always there to bring in a change as long as these two forces are equal there would be the state of inertia that would be the status quo okay and to break that shell and to bring in a change we have to improve we have to increase our driving forces so that we can overcome the resistances and can move towards the betterment and development okay so the action plan would be involve all personnel in the design of the new process and educate them in the new system and unless and until we don't educate them they would not be there to unlearn their old values okay they would not be uh, there to uh, develop their trust uh, uh, relationship with the change that the organization is requiring to incorporate okay another example of a uh, force field uh, analysis is that there are certain forces of change for example uh, customers want new products that's the driving force improved production speed that is the driving force reduced training time that is the driving force low maintenance cost that is the force for change okay but against all these forces of change there are forces against change which might include uh, loss of staff over time uh, staff fearful of new technology impact of environment cost associations disruption and likewise so when the organization is concerned with upgrading the factory with new manufacturing equipment so we can have a clear analysis that what are the drivers of change and what are the resistors of change and if the resistance is more organization would not be able to incorporate that change which is the requirement of the time another uh, demonstration uh, of force field analysis is talking about the career goals and the life goals and remember that this force field analysis is not just restricted to the organization facility in our everyday social life these forces are always into play okay uh, for example if we look at the career goals and the life goals the helpers the driving forces can be resilience strengths growth mindset emotional intelligence focus so these are all the drivers of your life 
but at the same time there will be certain hindrances and those hindrances can be inflexibility weaknesses mixed mindset sorry fixed mindset lack of emotional intelligence self limiting behaviors self limiting stories and so on okay so for that particular uh, concern it is always suggested that the organizations and the people need to go for their swot analysis they need to know that what are the strengths those strengths are the driving forces what are the weaknesses those weaknesses are the resisting forces and what are the opportunities which we need to avail and what are the threats which we need to avoid okay so this force field analysis is very actively uh, used uh, whenever we are going to diagnose the change or we are going to uh, talk about the change uh, these models are going to help us in formulating our concerns of driving forces and resisting forces another force field analysis uh, which we have is talking about forces of change and forces against change in terms of when we say forces for change long term revenue market demand customer expectation unsustainable uh, costs competition these are all the forces of change okay and the forces against change can be company's culture time constraints uh, viability of new technology client adoption uh, conversion costs and there are so many ways in which the forces can always act against your drivers okay so remember one thing that again as i uh, 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 mentioned earlier that change is not like a magic it's not a debra gadebra we have to be very careful when we are talking about the change and its associated phenomena another expression which we can sometimes use in uh, describing and elaborating our uh, change is basically uh, demonstrated in this diagram which is known as ishikawa cause and effect diagram or fishbone diagram no doubt this particular diagram is there to trace the causes and the effects okay but we can also use this expression in terms of finding that what are the causes which are forcing us to go for that particular change okay so this diagrammatic representation can always be used as it is required uh, in this particular diagram that there is uh, the the effect is basically the change in the design and the contributing uh, causes can be uh, design related client related contractor related project related external uh, Uh, factors related which may include economic condition government change uh, government policy changes and problem with uh, neighbors and so many other things can come into play so subject to the requirement subject to the problem identification we can use these models to reach to uh, graphical representations that why when how where what is actually required okay uh another very famous uh, model related to the change is uh, kurt lewin's uh, model which is a three step change model uh, which is talking about unfreezing movement and refreezing okay uh, this unfreezing factor is basically talking about unfreezing the current status quo okay unfreezing the inertia okay and then the driving forces would be incorporated which would be overcoming the resisting forces and the movement which is actually the transformation and the change it would be taking place and we would take that change to a particular position and situation whichever is required and upon that particular situation when we reach to that particular level of uh, change required we have to refreeze the change phenomena because if we uh, don't refreeze it would be the state of inertia and we have to refreeze the phenomena to bring it in another state of inertia which is again a status quo okay so that is something which is devised by uh, kurt lewins which is a three step change model now we have gone through so far three models of change okay uh, i have tried to summarize all these three models in my own uh, model of change which is demonstrated in the next slide okay this is uh, my model of change uh, which i have uh, developed after consulting uh, so many uh, theories and uh, concerns uh, available to understand this particular and complicated uh, expression uh, you have to follow uh, my mouse cursor on the x axis we are taking time because it is said 
that without the change in time, no change can take place. And if we say that the change is taking place without change in time, that would be the state of inertia, which is indicated by this I. Okay, this yellow color I is indicating the inertia, which, which is stating that the T1 is not changing. Okay, so on the X axis, uh, we have taken time because change in time is directly proportional with the change in uh, organizational uh, perspective. And on the Y axis, I have taken change. Okay, this particular place where my mouse cursor is moving, this particular place is the status quo. Okay, that with the passage of time, no change is taking place. That is represented by this first horizontal line, first solid horizontal line. Okay, at this particular point, we have to unfreeze. Okay, this is the point where there is the requirement of the change identified. Okay, and when this requirement of the change is identified at this particular point, we have to apply the driving forces. The DR stands for driving forces, and RF are the resisting forces. So when we apply the driving forces and we overcome the resistances from this point in time, we are bringing in the movement. This diagonal line is representing the movement. Okay, this is the transformation. Okay, and remember that as I said, that change is directly proportional with the details of the project management. So this particular point T1 is basically the starting point of the project. Okay, the starting date, the initial date. Okay, and we have to go through the change progress and we have to freeze it at this point, which is C2 represented on this graph, which is C2. We have to freeze the change because that is the magnitude of change we are actually looking for. Okay, so that is the point I have referred as refreezing. And from the refreezing, again, the status quo is maintained. Sometimes it would happen that the resistance would be more, as I said, the resisting forces are four in number and the driving forces are three in number. Sometimes the resistance would be more as compared to the driving forces and the negative change can take place, which is represented by this negative slope. Okay, this first slope was positive. I said positive slope and that first positive slope is known as stress curve. That's a new, another name for it. It is a stress curve. Okay, but when the resistance is more and the driving forces is less, that is denoted by this uh, negative sloped curve and it is known as the SC dash. The SC dash stands for strain curve. This is stress curve, which is positively sloped and this is strain curve, which is negatively sloped. Okay, now uh, at this particular point, which I, upon which I said that you need to bring in a change, I have linked this with our initial uh, change model, which said anticipate need for change, develop practitioner client relationship and the diagnostic phase. These are all the aspects which are to be incorporated at this particular point. Okay, then this change is taking place and I have related this change with the action plan strategies and techniques. And when you are going to refreeze this particular change, I have linked that with self renewal, stabilize and neutralize phenomena. Okay, that is what we need to do in the refreezing. Okay, uh, now this particular refreezing is also known as institutionalization of the change. Okay, because uh, we have to institutionalize the phenomena that it should remain in this particular situation over a longer period of time. Okay, and then this negatively sloped curve is basically showing another point in time. In that particular point in time, there is more resistance, there is less driving force. And as a result, the negative change is taking place, which is not actually required. And with the negative change is taking place, that is creating the strain. And the strain would again lead you to a certain point where that change would again become the status quo, would again take the shape of inertia. Okay, so we can correlate all these models in this one uh, particular model, which is talking about the whole phenomena that how changes in different points in time can take place. And we can also calculate that how much time it has taken, which is delta T is equal to T2 minus C1, uh, T1, and delta C, which is the magnitude of change, that is C2 minus C1. So we can also calculate the magnitude, magnitude of change in negative ways or in positive expressions. Okay. Um, I wonder that if I could, you know, uh, uh, draw this, uh, the whole uh, model uh, for your uh, convenience, uh, but for the time being, we have to, you know, uh, 
online uh, in online uh, module and session we have to you know adjust with this uh, phenomena there is another expression which i have used in uh, this model uh, if i draw perpendiculars uh, from this point and from this point it would make a rectangle which is uh, dissected by a diagonal line okay converting into two triangles this is area above the curve and this is area below the curve okay now what is happening that whenever we are incorporating a change with the passage of time this way the time is going with the passage of time our resistance which is area above the curve is decreasing and our acceptance to the change is increasing okay but in this particular case uh, this is area above the curve that with the passage of time the area above the curve which is the resistance area is increasing and the acceptance to the change is actually decreasing okay so uh, this is how actually uh, i have tried to incorporate all the changes uh, into one uh, framework uh, which can give us a unified expression that how change can be elaborated how force field model can be discussed how uh, we can use different concerns into one uh, framework so that we can achieve the uh, required uh, graphical representation which can tell us which can uh, provide us the basis for our uh, change implementation and change progress and change uh, concerns uh, from here onward uh, we'll be talking about the crisis management okay so what i have tried to actually uh, do in this particular session that i'm giving you little flavors of what change is all about what models are being discussed under the concern of change then i'll be taking you to unplanned change perspectives which are related to the crisis management and disaster management and then i'll be telling you that how all these things are to be incorporated in terms of a project okay and after giving you the details of the project then we'll be moving towards the uh, development of our organizational development concern because we cannot you know pick up the theory of organization development unless and until we do not go through the details of uh, these nitty gritty topics okay uh, so when we talk about crisis management um, by the way i'll be taking your questions uh, in the start of next session uh, so when we talk about crisis management let's see that what can be a crisis and how can we deal with the crisis okay as i called it as unplanned change it is said that a crisis is defined as an event that by its nature or its consequences i repeat again a crisis is defined as an event that by its nature or its consequences kya hoga isme constitutes a threat to vital national interests or to the essential needs of the population or prompts rapid decision making and number 3 a crisis would be demands coordination between different departments and organisms or the elements or the components of an organization uh, which are to respond immediately because in terms of crisis we do, we usually do not have the time to think and respond actually the crisis calls for immediate action uh, to be taken Uh, the key features of a crisis are basically that the crisis would always come up with low probability the crisis would always come up with high impact and the crisis would always be triggered through uncertain ambiguous cause and effect relationships okay and obviously for that cause and effects uh, we can uh, come up with the details of uh, uh, ishikawa and uh, uh, fishbone diagrams but during the crisis uh, you do not come up with such models during the crisis you have to deal with the situation and after the crisis then you may calculate the cause and effect relationships that what caused what and what happened what common features of the crisis the situation materializes unexpectedly that is understandable decisions are required urgently time is short specific threats are identified urgent demands for information are received there is sense of loss of control during the crisis pressure build over time routine business becomes increasingly difficult demands are made to identify someone to blame because uh, there might be some trigger uh, coming from someone which has resulted into the crisis and 
outsiders take an unaccustomed interest reputation suffers and communications are increasingly difficult to manage so these are all the common features of a crisis uh, so what is crisis management then the crisis management is basically the steps taken to prevent a crisis from becoming a catastrophe or a disaster okay so that is the main concern we are focusing upon that if the crisis is unexpected if the crisis is coming up with a low probability then what is our role in it our role in it is that we have to try to incorporate the methods with which we can prevent a crisis from becoming a catastrophe or a disaster okay because if the crisis is turned into a disaster that would be the situation which would be dealt differently then so crisis management can be defined as a system or methodology of solving crisis situation we can be sure that the actual crisis situation will differ from will differ from our expectation okay so a crisis is like a virus the effects can be sudden insidious infectious or extremely dangerous like like that like we all know uh, we have gone through this pandemic of uh, situation uh, which is covid 19 situation so that is the situation of uh, crisis okay but at certain instances at certain places that crisis took the shape of disaster and at other places that crisis remained as a crisis if the people were able to respond to the sops if the people were there to respond to uh, the requirements associated with the crisis management now when we talk about crisis uh, perspective there are certain problem characteristics associated with the crisis management it is said that the crisis management is very complex and not easily predictable process okay as i said this is uh, something which is unplanned okay unforeseen so the problem can be explicated in three three claims the first claim is nobody knows when a crisis event will happen second the scenario of a crisis or emergency event can be expected and prepared for but the real situation will change it because we never can comprehend the whole scenario of the crisis and our knowledge of the crisis emergency event solution is developed step by step hour by hour and its current version has to be utilized continuously in the crisis event solution okay because crisis can always come up with its changing uh, phases and changing shapes and we have to be vigilant and we have to be continuously monitoring the situation so what is the purpose of uh, crisis management then the major purpose of crisis management is basically prevention prevention from turning it into a uh, disaster and another purpose of the crisis management is to ensure the survival and another purpose of the crisis management is basically to come up with successful outcomes okay so there are three criteria for of success when you talk about crisis management number 1 has organizational capacity be re being restored that at the end of the uh, crisis situation you have to see that either you are able to restore your original capacity or not second have losses been minimized and number 3 have lessons been learned because those learned lessons can be used in our next exposure to any unexpected situation now let's look at the crisis planning now that is very important uh, actually uh, because uh, once we are uh, uh, like trained to come up with crisis planning we will be better able to handle uh, with the crisis okay so when we talk about crisis planning it says that assesses risks uh, and uh, as we all know that we have to come up with uh, risk assessments uh, produce plans we should be able to learn from our past mistakes and we should be learn uh, we should be learning from our uh, previous exposures to the different crises and accordingly we should be developing the plans for the uh, future exposures define roles and responsibilities and technically speaking uh, those people are uh, specified that who are going to address to that any type of particular crisis in first step then appoint crisis management team a uh, draw up communication plan produce contact and organization chart related to the crisis management promote crisis ready culture people should be given certain uh, trainings and certain uh, you know uh, exercises uh, to come up with expected crisis whatsoever uh, the case may be it can be uh, uh, physical crisis it can be uh, financial crisis it can be uh, uh, climatic uh, you know uh, uh, downturns and uh, uh, catastrophes so promote crisis ready uh, culture uh, 
publish plans and conduct training and test review and practice uh, for any future uh, you know issues now pre crisis actions and preparations uh, that is what what we need to talk about it is said that crisis is no time to find yourself on a learning curve during the crisis it is not the case that you uh, write uh, models and you develop theories and you go for literature review during the crisis you have to immediately respond to the situation so community measures and emergency procedures are essential so people should be knowing people should be ready for any unforeseen uh, event as it can be uh, expected or as it can be assessed through the risk assessments so planning requires that crisis can occur at any time and very interesting finding which i have taken from a uh, research uh, evidence and it is saying that nine out of 10 crises occur when you are asleep probably after a late night or at a weekend okay so that is another interesting phenomena that usually crises uh, are having a certain you know uh, patterns in their happenings but not necessarily that every crisis should be subjected to our sleep time or should be subjected to the weekends uh, pre actions and uh, preparations that is what we can do okay uh, so it is said that pre crisis actions costs are often but not always a tiny fraction of the losses that are typically incurred by crisis for which there has been adequate preparation okay so uh, we have to see uh, the cost versus benefit analysis related to the crisis planning so it is very easy to underestimate the damage a crisis can do and to costs it can have and we have to be uh, careful about these things uh, so when we talk about pre-crisis actions and preparations it is said that uh, preparedness at commission level is important that there should be certain uh, people purely responsible for dealing up with such situations okay so there should be uh, prescribed emergency procedures there should be staff awareness there should be network of experts for urgent meeting and advice and there should be standard commission decisions safeguard clauses ready in all official languages okay and that should always be uh, shared with the employees and shared with the all concerned stakeholders okay uh, my zoom meeting time is ending please join in the next session